okay? In fact, most people fall into this stuff, Reza, because some guy in the community comes up to them and says, I can see your soul, I can read your soul, or I can read your path. Hello and welcome to the new episode of the RJV Show. Today's guest is none other than Hadi Tabrizi. He's a good friend who's based in uh, Arizona, USA at the moment. He has 15 years of Islamic research under his belt uh, in formal and informal education. Uh, he's an undergraduate major in health sciences and human kinetics. Uh, he's well versed in Eastern traditional medicine, which we'll get into. And he applies this uh, to his practice and holistic uh, health ex as a health expert uh, with his clients. And has had many success with uh, clients in losing weight, spiritual healing, uh, various lifestyle fixes, uh, such as poor sleep, vitamin deficiency, and so forth. In addition, he's a strong, he has a strong understanding of technology industry, uh, specifically in the cloud sector. The cloud sector. Uh, acting as a certificate <laughs> system uh, architect. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it's very important. On his spare yeah. time, and he's a motivational speaker, and that's where we met initially, which was in um, Canada. He was speaking yeah. and helping the youth specifically, which is a big requirement right now, for especially for the Muslim community and actually most most um, communities. So let's jump in. Uh, Aga Hadi. Hello. You are, in, <laughs> you are Alaikum Salam. Welcome to, to the show. You are based in um, America, right? And yeah. At the moment, so whenever this is broadcast, but at the moment where we're filming this episode, uh, your country is in a state of um, upheaval. Let's just put it politely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. for various reasons. Now, I just want to find out your based in arizona so that's for the, mm. for the viewers who are based in uk that's in the south uh kind of west just next to california yeah. i believe it's where yeah. the grand canyon is and uh phoenix famous uh, one of the famous cities yeah. in america phoenix and all the cacti and all that famous stuff can you tell me a little bit about yeah. the u.s rights is it happening in your state in in your locale and um as a uh, muslim with a middle eastern heritage how are you seeing it? Just just briefly, how are you seeing the whole thing unfolding? Uh, yeah, so I moved out here about six months ago. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there has been some sort of uh, unsettling behavior happening in the last while. Uh, and uh, it definitely has to do with the quarantining, the social unrest that comes out of it. And uh, you, can, you can see there's a lot of different parties during these riots. It's not necessarily to honor the killing of or to you know raise awareness about the killing of George Floyd and how horrible that was and how heinous that crime that officer did was. But there you can see that there's different organizations at play here. Um, you can see videos of even some police officers trying to add on to the havoc. Uh, and in, with regards to Arizona, it's been quite calm, nothing crazy. Uh, we did have in downtown, in one of the downtown areas, they did loot. A uh, very very high end store, I believe. And so, as of since then, our governor has told us to have an eight o'clock curfew. Don't stay out after eight, otherwise you're going to get marked or ticketed. That said, within reason. So, if a police officer pulls you over and you have an emergency, they're obviously not going to try and uh, stand in your way. But overall, you know, it's been quite peaceful in Arizona. Not too bad, uh, apart from the earlier um, outbreaks. Uh, I can't say the same for all the states. Uh, a lot of the uh, more liberal states have taken action, and uh, you know, unfortunately, there there are, there are groups that are trying to add fuel to the fire, and that's for their own agenda. And when that happens, is that it takes away from the premise of you know why we're actually doing this, and what we're doing is people are trying to ask for justice and trying to make sure it doesn't happen again to anyone else in George Floyd's situation. And this has been happening for decades upon decades, and. You know, part of me is happy that people are not okay with it anymore, but the other part of me is just sad because other people are taking advantage of all this positive energy uh, and they're turning it into something violent and something that it's not. So, you know, yeah. That, uh, that, that you said there's um, people who are adding fuel to flame. Do you think these are people who are possibly agitators or from, uh, you know, outside of the communities that... 
uh, are having the riots turn into um, looting and so forth? Or do you think it's a mixture of both um, people who've had, had enough and some of them are just criminals and then a small percentage? Because what's happened in what, the way I see how our news shows it in the UK yeah. is that yeah. it, it moves from legitimate grievances of a vast number of people because Recently, you start to see footage of police being brutal towards um, uh, journalists. Police are being yeah. brutal to uh, even the white uh, community, white people in America. Like there's a video recently of an a elderly 75-year-old man. He's no harm to anyone. The police are coming in and they push him. He falls down. His head hits the floor. Yeah. Blood is coming yeah. out. The police don't even stop to see if he's okay they just walk past him it's only the bystanders who happen to be there get involved yeah. call an ambulance and hopefully you save his life and stuff like that so it's gone for us it's like it seems like the police and the system of the police so that's the government you know the people in power right now uh not necessarily all of them so not all local authorities but the the, the federal government is basically have they're just showing no mercy it's about clamping down hitting hard even if you had a grievance it's finished don't even talk about it because some people started looting 99.9 percent .9 who didn't loot their voices and the reason for why they're looting is gone out the window is that something that 100%. is discussed in america as well or is it just like either you're completely with it or completely against it well what's happening is that a lot of americans are recording and showing that you know we're protesting but we're not the ones looting and these other faculties are um, for example, this organization Antifa, I don't know if you've heard of them, uh, these anti-fascist movement organizations, they actually bought a bunch of bricks and put them in front of the protesters to kind of instigate, you know, the throwing of this. There's another video that was released on Instagram of police officers destroying their own cars uh, just to add fuel to the fire to make it look like these protests are happening uh, incoherently without any purpose and people are just uh, you know, they've lost track of why they're there, but I don't buy that. Uh, and by the way, these videos only come online on Instagram, on Facebook for only an hour or so before their algorithm gets uh, catches these videos and removes it right away. So there is a lot of media manipulation happening, which has always been the case. I know you've been in media all, uh, for the majority of your life. So, so we know that, that there's a lot media of media is censoring stuff. Oh, big time. Big time, big time. Uh, there, there's so much censorship going on with regards to information being passed around about the uh, pandemic and the Wuhan uh, sickness that's going around. I don't want to say the actual word because I don't want your video to, uh, <laughs> to get removed. Um, but in any case, there's that. And then there's also these protests. We're only seeing maybe 30 seconds at a time of it, and we don't even know who is doing what anymore. Uh, and then there's also videos of Antifa getting involved, these anti-fascist movements that just want anarchy. Uh, they don't want any kind of regulating system. And if you, and you know, if, what this is doing is this is setting up the framework for martial law. And so sociologically, even whenever you listen to lectures from Dr. Jordan Peterson, for example, uh, he, he mentions that anytime the human, humans get chaotic, Okay, and things start going really bad, they have a tendency to digress towards order, even if it's at the cost of their own rights and their own comfort. So when we see excessive chaos happening, we always have to remember that there is this order that's going to come where, you know, you're going to see that military coming, you're going to see heads cracking, and then people are going to go back into their home, and they've actually lost more than they've gained from the result of these kind of behaviors. So the best thing is, you know, tell people, listen, protest, but if you're seeing this kind of stuff, get out of there. Because they're going, you're just adding fuel to the fire, just standing there and letting people loot in front of you, and you're not doing anything. You know, there's a lot of people that are trying to stop the rioters from acting out of line. But again, chaos is where the enemy is best at performing. Because in chaos, and you don't, you, you know, the, the tamer, the lion tamer holds that chair up. You know, have you seen the lion tamer with the chair and the whip? You know, he, he, he messes around with the corners of the chair so the lion loses focus in order to get get away with you know being in front of a lion it's all about that's the, exactly... the magician with the sleight of hand right he distracts you with this yeah. while he's doing something else okay. focus here while i do something here and that's so that's, that, that's virtually what's going to happen that's very interesting because you had that issue with the american economy right you had the um 
sleight of hand of coronavirus and then all of a sudden several trillion dollars being passed on to the most wealthy companies and oh, yeah. groups that run yeah. the country and majority of the people who are in england we say the working class i don't know what you call it in america but the working class kind middle of class get, we call them the middle class middle class, class. Yeah. Uh, getting yeah. shafted, uh, being promised with a hundred, what is it, one thousand two hundred dollar check, Similar which is checks, yeah. nothing, which right? Is you nothing. can't do, you nothing. can't do much with it. Um, no. So there's there's a problem with the system at the moment, right, in America. And yeah, what what I wanted to uh, talk to you about is how do you see what, what? First of all, what are the main top two three main issues of, with the problem with the system? Is it financial, economical, and um, let's yeah, let's start with that and then. I want to see where that goes from your perspective. The economic world, as we know it, regardless of the country today, is corrupt. Um, you can't say that the economic system that's going on today on a global scale, that is uh, through centralized banking. And if you research that, you'll understand what I mean by that. But to say that every dollar in existence right now has interest attached to it. Meaning every dollar that you could hold in your pocket right now, you owe it to somebody somewhere. Uh, so if there was one dollar in existence, there's two dollars of debt attached to it. That makes the entire uh, economy impure by any kind of righteous uh, understanding of you know religious principles. Even Thomas Jefferson, he was one of the founding fathers of America. He was strongly against centralized banking. And if you, if you just research the history of America and how we ended up in the hands of central banks, you'll understand that the inception of America was a very uh, beautiful, beautiful concept, but it was later polluted by the people that, you know, they, they, they don't want to see the working class flourish. They, they are like a reverse Robin Hood. They take out of the class, uh, they take out of the middle class's hands and give it to the elite. And the elite can go carry on with their, you know, agendas around the world and you know cause or havoc and just stay on top but the financial system regardless of what country you are in uh is 100 percent rigged you are not allowed to prosper beyond a certain amount uh and um and and the countries that don't abide by this are the countries that we have sanctions against the countries that don't have central banks are the ones that are suffering the most right now uh, that, that take the most heat for actions they never committed to. I mean, you know, we know this from Iran. Iran is one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have a central bank and refuses to have a central bank. Prior to Iran, it was Iraq. Iraq during Saddam's time didn't have a central bank. And as soon as Saddam fell, we saw a central bank being established. Syria was another one prior to the inception of ISIS. And today there's only two countries that stand tall to say, we don't want any kind of rigged economy in our system. Now, while their economies might be failing because of the sanctions and global distaste towards them, these countries just don't want it in their system for their own uh, specific reasons, Iran being more of a religious reason, and then there's North Korea, and that's their own uh, regime that we don't need to talk about. But in any case, the, the idea of central banks ruling the world has rigged the economy. We are subservient to pieces of paper you know, what's the difference between a $100 bill or a 100 pound bill, uh, you know, note there and a $1 one? It's just ink. Yeah. And so if you realize you've just been lied to all your life to say that this paper somehow has more significance than this other one with just the ink being different, then you'll realize that this entire world, uh, it, it's like that Wizard of Oz, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, you, you've been sold the wrong, uh, the wrong idea of wealth. We've been sold the wrong idea of what our time is worth. Uh, and, and with every, every day that passes, with all this printing of this paper that virtually costs nothing, the amount of time we put into our lives are becoming less and less valuable. Because the more you print, the more things inflate, the more you have to work to keep up with those prices, the more time you have to put in, and the less, uh, and the less valuable your time becomes. And ultimately, you become subservient without even realizing it, that your entire life you were subservient to making paper and paying bills made of paper itself. <laughs> unless unless you're part of the big elite, you're basically not going to be, um, it's not going to be, life's not going to be easy for you. So this, um, this is interesting because um, obviously because of this uh, pandemic and the financial problems and basically just all of a sudden, for some reason, uh, uh, we were making like Britain 
England and America the same. Yeah. The GDP yeah. of England uh, is more now than it was 10 years ago, than it was 20 years yeah. ago, than it was. So there's money, more money being made. But then we have more food banks. When I came to England 30 years ago, I never, I never saw food bank in my life. I didn't know what a food bank was. Yeah. 30 years ago, England's GDP wasn't 5 billion. It was less. Somehow, 5 billion pounds of GDP now is not enough to provide yeah. enough food. So that's what food bank is. It gives you food yeah. to the people that need it in this country. I don't, I don't, I'm not yeah. going to go to a third world country or a country that is developing. Let's talk about England. Let's talk about America. Yeah. Country yeah. that GDP has tripled or whatever in the last 10, 20, 30 years has more mm -hmm. poor, you know, there's a, a larger po population that are poor under pov of official poverty line of the UK. We're not even talking about someone else saying it. No, their own UK statistics. More people are, are suffering. And yet, as you said, this the whole system is being perpetuated and pushed forward and a small number of people are becoming successful based on lies and illusions and magic illusions. almost like yeah. black magic almost like the magic that was used by uh the pharaoh you know by the by the uh what they're called by the the sorcerers that he had to yeah. rule his people you know in, in islamic tradition uh, Moses goes, yeah. and I think also the same in, Christ, in Christianity, Moses goes to Egypt and yeah. then tells Pharaoh, look, what you're doing is wrong. You need to stop pretending you're God. You need to let the people of faith go, the Israelites, and stop right. being oppressive and make these claims. And then he sends his um, uh, magicians forward and they challenge yeah. Moses. And then Moses does even a more, you know, prov uh, provides a more powerful magic trick which you can hopefully elaborate for us a little bit more now yeah yeah um so well, is there is there a question or do you want me to just talk about the story so i want you to talk about how yeah. because the problem is people think that all of a sudden america invented the system of tricking people and making people believe in things and then ruling them this goes yeah. back centuries and millennia far 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 yeah it i'm just going as far and... back as egypt because egypt was I think from my memory, one of the oldest and first great um, empire civilizations and so hence yeah. and, and, and it used these kind of tricks. Oh, 100 percent. And the people that were using these kind of tricks, like trading gold in for pieces of papers. Uh, so what would happen is that in Egypt, uh, these uh, Israelites uh, would come and what they would do is they would discover a concept called the bank. And the bank originally started out with this notion that uh, you're going to give us your wealth and we're going to protect it for you. And anytime you want it, you can come get it. All right. Now, uh, if you understand what happened in 2008 with the real estate crash here in America, then you'd understand exactly what was going on back then. So what would happen is people would, for example, get their gold coins or whatever kind of precious metals they were accepting for their services. For example, selling cookies. Um, and, and so they would go and put it in the bank saying the bank is going to take care of it for a small fee. Now, at some point, people realized that while they were giving their gold or their wealth to this bank, that same bank was loaning it out to other people with interest. And so anytime you would put gold into that bank, they would give you a receipt, a written note with a signature on it, for example, saying, hey, you can come get your gold back anytime. Uh, and eventually people realize that when they all go back to the bank and ask for all their gold back and they open the vault, the gold's not there. Why? They lent it out for, to other people with interest. And that was the first time human beings realized that centralized banking is the corrupt system. And the people in Egypt that actually ended up doing that got executed. Because there's something that you don't mess with when it comes to human beings. You don't mess with their spouse and you don't mess with their money. People don't like it. People never liked it. But instead, in 2008, when the exact same thing happened on a global scale, a huge crash happened, rather than put the banks in jail for lending out money they never had, we went ahead and we bailed them out with our tax dollars. And then we played it off saying that we need them. Well, why do we need this system? Why do we need a system where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, uh, and, and the banks, if they screw up, if they go bankrupt, the government is going to back them up with the hard-earned money of the people. 
right? So that's the difference between back then Egypt and today. Uh, I mean, with Egypt, they to, executed them, huh? They got rid of them, straight, done, finished. Um, get out of here. We don't want to deal with you people. That's why there was a strong stigma by the time Prophet Moses came around with regard to doing business with those kind of people. So that, that's interesting. Um, just going back to earlier what I said about magic. Uh, so, we, you know, this is the financial system. Um, somehow I feel like mm. the, um, not necessarily magic, but there's some evilness that is being used to make people kind of like uh, accept these things. I feel like the 100%. world, because we, we have this, we have this um, idea that we think as the world develops, people become smarter. And as yeah. they become smarter, they see realities and truths and you know it's hard to trick them but i don't see that i feel like people like it's easier to trick them or it's the same now than it was a millennia you know thousands of years ago right um yeah 100 yeah so one of the things that i found interesting was this concept of uh black magic right black magic mm. jeans things like this um i yeah. think we 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 discussed this at some time before and you were telling me stuff about it that I found uh, I found interesting, right? Because I thought it's something yeah. that doesn't affect us in 220. And, you know, I live in London. There's no such thing as jeans here. There's no such thing as black magic. You get up, you eat your breakfast, yeah. you go to work, you come back. It's all regulated. It's all normal. Yeah. But there's some stuff that you were telling me how it affects us even living here now. So let's go back to, to the history of... And I want this to be a, a kind of a learning uh, a, a program for those who are not aware of how magic started and how dangerous it is and, and, and how um, the, the faith of uh, Islam uh, is negative towards the practice of it. So can you introduce us to the history of it and how we it's come into being for us as, as Middle Easterners in the world really? Yeah, uh, so to, to answer the first part of what you said with regard to, you know, you would think people are getting smarter, but um, it, it looks like the the influence of, you know, evil has never been more powerful on us to the extent that we may engage in things without putting our full thought into it. The answers are right there in front of us for the longest time, yet nobody really wants to sit there and look at the world for a second because we're in a state of distraction. We're always distracting ourselves. Even even right now, if you have nothing to do, you're more than likely to sit there, pull out your smartphone and watch a YouTube video and sit there and look inside your wallet and look at, for example, that US dollar bill. That one dollar bill is plagued with satanic symbols. And nobody wants to sit there and look at it. You know? Everybody knows the music industry has been plagued with, you know, this, you know. Everybody has seen these pop stars make symbols like this. You know, what are these called? These are called devil horns. And nobody want, and you still listen to the music. You still use those dollar bills. You still pay interest. You still go ahead and watch those movies that are full of satanic rituals. Uh, and so uh, people don't understand that we have gotten to a point where we might be actually committing to these things and doing these things, thinking we're doing it for you know Islamic purposes or religious purposes, but we're actually plaguing our lifestyles with means beyond our control. Now, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is, it's been incredibly difficult to make people understand one fundamental point. We are in a spiritual war, not a physical war. I know we have killings happening all over the place, but we are in a spiritual war that is beyond many of our comprehension. And do you know why nobody wants to understand this? Do you know why there's such a significant point to say that Everything is material. Everything is scientific. There's no spirituality. There's no metaphysical entities. There are no jinns. There are no ghosts. There is no magic. Everything is just mythology. In fact, if you go and read the research about jinns, they call it Islamic mythology. And they try to, you know, remove the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, in this book of truth spoken from the creator, has made mention of these entities for us to reflect and stay away from. Why would he mention that if it's mythology? Why have we classified all of these religious principles uh, from the divine as myths? And so the reason why is that if people even got a semblance of idea, and I'm saying the good-hearted people, if they even had a semblance of idea about the metaphysical, about the spiritual realm of things, 
then they would also understand a fundamental point that there is an afterlife. See, many people call themselves Muslims, but they live as if they don't have an afterlife. Do you agree with me? Many people live their life as if they're not, that this is it. YOLO. You only live once. So let's, let's focus on our wealth. Let's focus on making as much money. Let's focus on that house. Let's focus on that car. Let's focus on getting this and that. And so there is no effort for the human being to want to step outside the box for a second and ask, hey, is this economy I'm living in pure? Am I doing a lot of service by supporting these things, these, these horrible actions that are happening around the world? And so what happens is if you dismiss the spiritual aspect of the religion, that, and this is not only exclusive to Islam, this is in Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, this is all around us. These spiritual symbols today are being used by the people that are wielding evil. They're putting it in front of us to desensitize us from these things, to make us think that there is no afterlife, so don't rebel because we'll kill you. Now, if you took anything from the message of the Muhammad alayhi salam, is that death is not the end. In death, the believer finds sanctuary. In martyrdom, does Imam Hussein attain his rank. Even in the Christian philosophies, now while Muslims don't uh, believe that uh, Jesus was crucified, but they truly understood that when the Jews of the time came to crucify Jesus, they tried to make him unpopular. Even the concept of crucifixion in Jewish thought was that only an indecent person would be crucified. And therefore, that's why they put Jesus there, to say that he's not a prophet, he's not God, he's an indecent person, because that's the only reason why he would be crucified. And as a result, what happened? This made Jesus even more popular, even more recognized, even before the re resurrection. So, so this concept of the afterlife and spirituality and you know beyond the physical has been suppressed so greatly uh for for one purpose rebellion they don't want you to rebel they want you to be a good little hamster on your wheel and keep fueling a system that belongs to evil so you discussed about tools that they use to try and you know um get you away from god uh, talk to me about some of the experiences you had with that with those kind of tools that you've seen you know the stuff that is um to be honest, sometimes uh, I believe in it, right? So I believe in the uh, black magic. I believe in jinn, as it's mentioned in the Quran. And sometimes me personally, like, oh, I don't really want to know too much about it because then I'm at night trying to lie there and these thoughts come <laughs> out and, you know, you're looking at the dark, you know, uh, door corridor and I'm thinking, because I thought about them, are they going to come? Obviously, it's not as easy as that. It's not as, they're not as accessible, no. as easy as that. But... For example, we as Muslims, we have things where, you know, we have these pouches, right? Yeah. And like many religions, and inside these pouches, we have these du'as. For example, these du'as are written on skins of, um, I don't know, like Animals. deer. Yeah. And we have these uh, stones that have these um, kind of like uh, written text on it, in some in Hebrew mm -hmm. and Arabic and prayers and du'as. Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your thought about that stuff? Tell me about how you think how we should be careful or not careful about how we use those things. Well, you know, I don't I don't express myself in this situation from my own opinion. I, I've had a lot of uh, clients that have come to me. Um, and what what I realized back in 2018 was when I first saw my first client that was experiencing uh, spiritual illness. Uh, and, and I didn't believe it because, you know, like I said, many people just want to live in the physical. So I said, look, this is, you got like a multivitamin deficiency, you know, you need some more probiotics, your gut, the brain health is not doing well. Uh, and, you know, I, w I would go on to, you know, hand out these supplements to help with these uh, pre-medicinal issues and nothing would get better. And so the person would tell me, well, I could have sworn someone gave me something to eat once. And I could have sworn that, you know, you know, I, I think this ring is carrying some sort of negative energy. I don't know. And so for the first time, out of curiosity, one night, I actually went ahead and I, I, I found, uh, you know, symptoms of people that described this. And on top of that, I also found a journal, a peer-reviewed journal today that's published on NCBI in case anyone's interested in uh, reading it. It's called uh, Ethnopsychiatry, where they treat uh, psychiatry patients. You know, psychiatry, psychiatry is different from psychology. Psychiatry is what they grade someone who is, a, a like medically ill right it's, it's a form of medicine like they prescribe because you're mentally something's wrong psychology is more like counseling 
So ethnopsychiatry, these are people dealing with schizophrenia, schizophrenia uh, and all kinds of other issues, like multiple personality disorder and stuff like that. And so this Tunisian girl came in at this case study. She was half Tunisian, half Italian. And uh, in, in this journal, it mentions that she was describing that which we see in our text as jinn. And she was a Muslim girl. And she, now she was never taught what jinn actually looks like, but she was experiencing these, you know, these, these uh, episodes where, you know, she thought something was choking her or something like that. Uh, and, and, and in Farsi lore, in Iranian lore, we also have what we call a bakhtak. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. <laughs> but, you know, that little goblin that sits on your chest while you're sleeping and tries to, you know, strangle you. Or in... They, they, they refer to it in the scientific terms as sleep apnea, right? Not sleep apnea, sleep paralysis. Sleep apnea, yeah. Sleep apnea is when you snore. Uh, but sleep paralysis... Uh, now, now in, in Western cultures, like the UK and even in the US, they call it the old hag that strangles you. <laughs> it's a weird thing. It's people are experiencing the same thing around the world. They don't know what's wrong with it, and they're they're depicting it in different ways, but it's doing the same thing. Because I had so a dream Tunisian like girl. A lot of people do. A lot of people do, and they don't understand what's going on, and they're like, "Ah, it's just I'm just crazy." And I remember I was uh, trying to wake up because I saw this dark shaped <laughs> figure coming, and as soon as I saw it coming through the door in my room, I felt uncomfortable. I felt evilness, right? So within yeah. the sleep, because when you're asleep, you don't realize you're asleep. But for some yeah. reason, uh, in that sleep, and you're trying to wake up because you know you're between sleep and reality and you want to get away from it. So you're yeah. trying to move, but you know your whole body is not moving. So you've become even more uh, uh, scared. and you, you know, it, you, Like I've lost control, I have no control and so forth. Until it becomes so close and you manage to somehow jerk yourself, you know, something to make yourself wake up. So yeah. I, I think a lot yeah. of people have experienced that. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And and what you're experiencing there, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says like, he takes your soul when you sleep and then he places it back in you when you wake up, right? And so there's this transcendence when the human sleeps. It's like it's almost like a minor death. Uh, and they say, scientists have understood that the brain waves completely change when you're about to sleep. They go into a, a state of theta waves. And this is where your consciousness becomes closest to your subconscious. And some, some would say this is where your consciousness becomes closest to your fitra. And it's a very spiritual thing. So they say the last thing you think of before you sleep will show you how your day will go the next day. Show me your thoughts and I'll show you your, your future. You know, these are, these are concepts that have been around for centuries. Yet today, people just try and dismiss it as much as they can because they don't know what to make of it. Uh, so, so in this journal, uh, with this half Tunisian, half Italian girl, they got a sheikh to come do some Islamic ritual. And it doesn't say what he did, but he did it. And then they did a follow-up with this girl that they had originally diagnosed with having schizophrenia or hallucinations. Um, they saw that her symptoms had completely gone. And so now they realize that in the realm of psychiatry, it's not enough to just to give people pills and say, you're crazy. Maybe a lot of these emotional or mental issues that they're having could be healed based on the individual's ethnicity and religious belief. That's a huge stepping stone for the realm of psychiatry, a, a, a field, by the way, that has been plagued by the pharmaceutical companies to give people, you know, ADHD, ADD pills without really, you know, or antidepressants and all this. This field to take this step is huge. And I only wish people would understand the implications of religious and spiritual healing. Uh, in this world that we live in. So, are you saying that the the sheikh that came to help in this um, in this study perform exorcism on the girl? Is that the kind of stuff mm -hmm. he did? Yeah. So, in Islam, we call it ruqya. Ruqya is called uh, is basically Islamic exorcism. And um, what happens is they use certain verses of the Quran, like the one you mentioned about Musa and the serpent and the sorcerers. That's one of the verses that I've studied that these shriuch use uh, in order to help cure people. Because what happens is those sorcerers were using magic. But what Allah did is that when Prophet Musa hit his staff, Allah showed that his majesty and his authority trumps all black magic. Any kind of magic that exists, Allah will always trump it. And then what do they say at the end of that verse? We bear witness in the Lord of Harun and Musa. So this was a victory of the believers over people that were trying to cause illusion and minor miracles to divert them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, where does magic come from? Uh, there is 
there is so much dilution in this uh, in this field that um, people just dismiss it. You know, with movies like Harry Potter <clears throat> and I don't know whatever else. Okay, I don't know. Is there magic in Game of Thrones? I never watched it, but uh, but these kind of movies that kind of exaggerate dragons and all this stuff. Uh, you know, they, they, they take a lot from uh, religious belief, and then they take a little bit from their own imagination, and then they exaggerate it and put it in front of people to desensitize them from the real part. And it's kind of diluting it with fantasy. So, for example, in Aladdin, we grew up watching that. You know, Aladdin was the first kind of like Arabian culture thing that Disney did. And you can tell. Looking back, these guys did their research with regards to Arab mythology or Arab spirituality because that genie that grants the wishes for Aladdin uh, is a pure depiction of a type of jinn described in our book. Uh, the, the genie in Aladdin, by the way, jinn is plural. Jinni is singular. So when they say genie, they're literally referring to him as a jinn. He is a single jinn. Uh, and so he comes out in this kind of like smokeless flame flame format and smokeless flame in science is also called the combustive flame like that blue flame at the end of that you know that propane tank when you see that blue flame that's what they're referring to so you see the genie originally come up and you know he's got all these magical powers he can snap his fingers and things can appear okay those are one of the abilities of the genie. and then he says let me grant your wishes so now they're they're kind of making the genie look like this really cute like god-like being that will help people you see that? They took a lot of Islamic and, you know, even Arabian understanding of jinn. They made it look cute and funny and charming. And then he says, We're, well, I'm going to help this poor Aladdin whose life is a mess. Right? And so now people think that if I go to a jinn, he's going to have to come and help me. Jinn don't do that. Jinn do that at a cost. And that's, that's what black magic is. Black magic is asking to borrow a jinn's power for a cost. So this is these are these are um, uh, things happening or in media and books because there's there's a lot of interest in the occult within people in uh, in in the West. Uh, I need you research it. It's 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 been forever, right? Um, this this interest in the occult and magic and black magic and and the powers that it can utilize and everything, it's been utilized in media and all places for the benefit of certain people right at the detriment yeah. of others um mm -hmm. so it exists and, and 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 i think the way you're describing it it doesn't matter if you believe in islam as a muslim or if you're not a muslim it's possible it can uh, impact you and affect you because it's a reality within life right it's it not the reality it's there, not there is it's, yeah it's not based on your um belief or belief system so how do we let's say us as muslims how do we counter it right and is it possible that it doesn't really affect us because we in the west as much unless we live in i don't know middle east and iran iraq tunisia whatever is it can it come from there to here is there been cases of things happening from there that have come to this part of the world that's affected people here a hundred percent a hundred percent a lot of times i see people come back and by the way i have helped dozens of people get this stuff out of their life not because i have any kind of spiritual powers not because i i you know i claim that i'm uh, i have god has gifted me with some sort of exorcism abilities you don't need any of that okay in fact most people fall into this stuff reza because some guy in the community comes up to them and says i can see your soul i can read your soul or i can read your path or i can i can heal you with my hands Okay, these people, okay, they're trying to say that they're so religious or spiritual that Imam Mahdi or God or some sort of de deity has given them the ability to help you. Okay, that's red flag number one. Do you understand why? Because first of all, we as Muslims understand one point. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There is no strength except that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? So there's no, no one can cause a uh, change except that of Allah's uh, uh, strength. So these people that come and say, and I, I have seen it, they're old ladies or old men, let me blow on your head. They might even open up a Quran and start blowing on you. This behavior, this is stupidity. 
Because what you're doing is now you're making that individual your wali, right? You become subservient with, to them without realizing it on a spiritual level. So when you sit on a plane, you become subservient to a pilot, right? You become subservient to a pilot because he's going to take you from point A to point B. You can't say anything. You can't tell him how to drive, right? But in this sense, these people who are telling you, come to me, I'm going to heal you. And then they start giving you duas that they wrote down, but you don't know what the heck is dua is. They give you talismans to wear. They give you those pouches that you showed earlier. Uh, and so what they're doing is they're, you are now investing your trust in something that's other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a practice that has not been mentioned in any hadith. Not Sunni, not Shia, nothing. Nobody has ever said, go look, look for these people that will tell you to come to them and they will heal you with their hands because they're so great and mighty. So that's the first level of people who are practicing witchcraft in the community. These people will show up to your centers, to your mosques. You'll see them when you go for your pilgrimages. They will come and say, uh, let me help you. I can tell there's something wrong. Walk away from these people. These are how they try and misguide you. And they try to use, and, they, and they'll pray, by the way. But their chances are they don't even have wudu when they're praying. It's kind of like a taqiyah for them. <laughs> um, so that's the first level. The second thing I've noticed is that when people go for these pilgrimages, they come back with all kinds of trinkets. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm actually going to send some pictures for you to just show up on the podcast as well, just for people to see. You'll see like stars, you'll see squiggly lines, um, and every, and even some scholars, unfortunately, say that, oh, this is a good dua, you should use it, but they have no idea what they're talking about. Because by definition, talismanic writing is a writing that is a storage of magic with the intention of using magic. And uh, there's an interesting book called a... Um, spiritism, jinns, and demons, something like that in Islam by Maximilian Lafayette. And you're going to see that he visits a rabbi and this rabbi is teaching him how to invoke the, uh, invoke the power of jinn. And he actually uses the word jinn in it. A rabbi is called talking about jinn. And, and those squiggly lines and those stars that you're seeing on the back of your ring, like the Sharaf Hashem's ring, those, those du'as that they fold up and tell you never to open and wear on you, and it's going to protect you, it's going to give you all. Those are all invoking certain jinn. You have. In fact, they classify that jinn <laughs> using the Quran when it comes to Suleiman uh, requesting that someone retrieve the throne of she the queen of Sheba. You know, and, and Allah says specifically in Surah 27, verse 39, He says, Allah ifritum in a jinn. And, and the ifrit among the jinn come and say, I can get you the throne in, uh, in the amount of time it takes for you to get up from your chair. You know, that's what it says in the ayah. So we're seeing that the jinn has that ability to teleport, grab something and come back in no time. And this book it's showing all the symbols, all those crazy circles and sigils. You know that blue eye with that blue hand and the eye and all those things we hang around our houses? All of those things are within this book saying that it's pure magic. But we have taken it in as culture. And we have allowed these things in our life. And we are calling upon things that we don't understand. And now someone says, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he does not allow magic to affect you except by his will. And that is true. But brothers and sisters, you know, I tell everybody, uh, if you're going to bring these things into your house, if you're going to just wear these and have faith in these little amulets and pendants, then what you're doing is you're just stepping into the lion cage and expecting the lion not to attack. Because that's what magic is. It's a wild animal that will decompose your life. You should not be messing with these things. What's the intention of these people, you know, doing the magic like you said, like you you go to visit one of these countries, they come up to you and say, "Oh, I'm going to tell your future," or just the random things that they do. What what's their intention? But why do they do this? What benefit do they get? There's three intentions. Okay, the first one is you have to understand there's a hierarchy of these kind of practitioners. Okay, the grand master of these guys are the elite we see today, right? These guys. Uh, they're controlling everything. And it's not because they're super genius. It's because they are offering things to uh, supernatural beings that allow them to do these things. And they don't care about the evil they cause. 
See, a good person can never win against an evil person who doesn't play by the rules, right? Unless there is a divine being that trumps all those games. But you are not going to win a game of basketball with a guy who cheats all the time. And what we're doing is we're playing by their rules and they cheat when they feel like it. So those are the highest up. And then there are these knights, right? These knights are these ones that try to recruit, come for our cause. So these are, these are kind of like recruiters. And what they're doing is they're fulfilling the wish of these, uh, let's say, jinn or demons or whatever you want to talk, call them. Uh, they're, they're, they're recruiting for them because I said, magic always comes at a cost. And they'll even say it in these movies and shows right now. There is always a cost when it comes to magic. So the jinn doesn't just lend them their abilities for fun. You got to do something for me. So these are the knights. And then we have those peasants. Those peasants are there to just get the good graces and have some small gain in life. And they, they usually amount to nothing. And these are the most common ones in our community. These are peasants. These are useless beings that their only job in the world is to increase despair. How do they do that? Much like how we give charity. We oftentimes, we just drop the charity in a box in the mosque in our houses with the intention of giving it to a random person we've never met before to increase the khair, to increase the goodness of Allah in the world. And in exchange for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He rewards us by lengthening our life and giving us wealth in other places, correct? So the same way this subservience to evil and the evil spirits or jinn or shayateen or however you like to describe them, these people have hierarchies. And the bottom level of people is to give you you know, rings with talismanic writing and telling you it's dua. This is going to help you get closer to Allah. Uh, you know, they're going to tell you, uh, read this dua, or they're going to give you a dua to hang from your door or to put under your pillow. These are all the most stupid acts of shit. But, you know, Reza, the reason why people are doing this today, not only is it because it's, we're heading towards the end of time, I, I have conviction that people are thirsty. People are thirsty for some sort of miracle in their life. They're looking for that champion. They're looking for that Messiah to come take their hand and take them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to take them towards the God. And when, when you know, we're in the occultation, we're in the ghaybat, the majority of the believers, you know, we don't have access to that. And there's a reason why we don't have access to that. But the people that are so desperate to get some sort of semblance of miracle, oftentimes with good intentions, end up in the wrong alley and they go to the wrong people and then they give their faith to the people that are playing with demons beyond their comprehension. And I feel bad for these people because they end up ruining their lives. And as the Quran says in uh, Surah Baqarah verse 102, and, and they learned magic and they caused discord between man and wife. They caused divorces in the community. Uh, and these are one of the many symptoms that I've seen happen where men and wife just can't be together because they allowed these trinkets, these kind of beliefs, these kind of people into their lives. So it's happening now, like this whole problems with divorces and marriage, with things like this, people using oh, magic yeah. and and you witnessed yeah. it. Um, what can we do as uh, as Muslims? So I don't know if non-Muslims watching this, what they can do. But as Muslims, we we have certain rituals like pray, uh, eating um, uh, you know halal meat meat that has been uh, prescribed by through the Islamic uh, in name of God being pronounced and so forth and so on. What are the things that we as Muslims can do to protect ourselves from this kind of uh, unwanted evil in our lives? A hundred percent, nine times out of 10. I think I've only seen one case where the individual didn't fall in this category, one. But nine times out of 10, when people come uh, and, and they're starting to explain their symptoms, and based on the symptoms, I start asking qualifying questions. I say, well, has someone around you told you they have powers? They go, yeah, I'm in contact with the Sheikh in Iran. He's giving me, uh, he's telling my future. He's describing a fortune teller to me, but he's calling it a Sheikh in Iran. Uh, you know, oh, or I say, uh, did you, do you have any kind of writing that's not Arabic? Again, I keep this under my pillow, you know, at night it's supposed to give me wealth. You know, stuff like that. Nine times out of ten, the people that are doing this, they are, they qualify themselves as Muslims, but I ask the next question and they all fail to answer. I said, are you praying? They say no. And I say, why not? And if you find the dumbest excuses. You'll say like, I don't have time. Or it just doesn't hit the spot for me anymore. I'd rather do yoga. You know, stuff like that. Excuses like that. And so, you know, 
ultimately, Salat is not supposed to hit the spot for you. You know, Salat is a regimen. You know? Sometimes you might go to the gym and you might work. You'll feel great. Sometimes you go there, you're dragging your feet. You don't feel like it. You don't feel like exercise, but you still do it. Why? Because the outcome is the most important part, not how you feel during. Yes? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his blessed book, the timeless, the eternal Quran, says, in the salata tanha and al fahsha wal munkar. The salat, the establishment, indeed, the establishment of salat is there to protect you from corruption and evil. Do you think he's joking with us? He's like, hey, just waste your time, five, ten minutes a day, and there's no, nothing that will come out of it. You know, even in, in the, in, when uh, shaitan talks to Allah, he says, by your authority, I'm going to misguide them, I'm going to stay on the street path, I'm going to uh, make the path murky for them, and illusion-like. And then but he says, but I cannot touch the mukhlasin, the pious ones that you've chosen. I cannot touch them. You know, there is so many places that, you know, you can draw a red line and say, well, this stuff is not going to affect me. And that's why when people ask me, well, you know, when you talk about this stuff, aren't you scared when you go to sleep? Aren't you scared when you come into contact with people that might be going through these things? I say, you know, I'm doing my best to uphold the regimen that Allah has prescribed. And based on my faith, I have never experienced any kind of nightmare. Uh, I have never had a jinn try and strangle me in my sleep. Uh, I have any kind of, uh, you know, I, I, and, I, and I also revamped my house because I noticed that I had a lot of weird things in my house that were brought from Islamic stores. Like there, there was a Dhul Taqar of Imam Ali alayhi salam being sold at an Islamic store that was imported from Turkey and it had that blue eye on it. And if you look at the origins of the blue eye, it's all magic based. It has no religious significance, but they keep saying it'll protect you from evil eye. And nobody wants to sit there and go, well, who said that? You know, why are you attaching Eiffel Kursi to a blue eye? Why are you attaching verses of the Quran to a blue eye? Why are you putting a Mamali sword next to a blue eye? Are these fashion statements or are you just bringing things that you have false faith in? That's very interesting. We never thought of that because of this stuff that... Like with the blue eye or the, uh, they call it the, the hand of Abbas or Fatima, uh, various names, you know, they add to it. They actually call it the hand of Mary as well. So they, the they just labeled Yeah. They called it, yeah, Bibi Maryam. These, yeah. these things, um, we, we are right. We never question it is, oh, my, my parents did it. So it must be all right. Right. Um, as opposed to us saying, okay, let me see where this is mentioned in Islamic text, in the Quran. Uh, not just because my mom and dad did it or my uncle or auntie did it or loads of people in the Middle East did it. Where does it actually come from? What's the source? And if Quran is the word of God, should we not be looking at things in there more, utilizing? So a lot of times I, sp I spoke to a sheikh, to a sayyid, and there's this book brought from Iran and it has, um, you know, mustahab ad -da so So prayers that are uh, recommended to help you with various things. And then he just, you know, I remember him, I really remember him, he goes, he goes, focus on your vajabat, focus on those things that are obligatory on you, and this yeah. stuff will come itself later. Don't worry about focusing on things that are recommended, and forgo and forsake, and forget things are which are uh, obligatory on you. Things like eating yeah. halal food, things like not lying, things like not stealing. And people think stealing, they go, I didn't rob a bank. No, did you like, you know, someone accidentally give you extra 30, 30 cent, 50 cent, one dollar? Or did you trick someone into charging them more money when you weren't being honest about something? You know, that's stealing, right? Because that money comes in and pollutes everything that it touches. Did you, um, you know, pray like you said? Are you fasting? Are you doing the things that are obligatory onto you? And if you are, then those other things which are... Um, Recommend it, they will come itself and it's, it becomes easier for you to do and easier for you to identify which one is fake and which one is uh, accurate. So this, I, yeah. I really believe in this idea of doing things which are, um, uh, uh, staying away from things which are prohibited and sticking to things which are um, advised that you have to do. So then yeah. um, we come to a point now where, so we have an understanding, we need to be a little bit more aware about our surroundings, especially in our home. Right, a lot not, more. To, yeah. not to bring yeah. not to bring things which we are uh, we're not um, a hundred percent sure are accurate. So that's something that I don't think a lot of people have thought about. I thought that uh, you know they go to um, 
to the various holy cities within the Middle East. They visit these places. They are given, you know, they're not given, they buy them. We buy these, right? And we never yeah. read them. We just put it, bring it, carry it all these days and years and everything. Never opening it, reading it. Sometimes like, I can't make out what it says. It must be good. Then I'll put it in. Right? So yeah. your advice is little, be more aware about what you do, what you bring in. Right? And things, yeah, unless yeah. you... Uh, and if you can't be sure yeah. to verify it with someone, I mean, as you can't verify it in a book that has uh, accurate sources, maybe it's best to be precautionary and not necessarily splatter it all over the house and, you know, look at it as a as a way of um, helping you and stuff like that. So that's a very good lesson that I think we can take from that. Uh, yeah, fi I finally, finally um, so this is good advice as in a practical advice of what we can do to stay away from things like that. Uh, and you discussed about symbolism, didn't you? You said, uh, for example, I watched a, a movie, um, and I don't know if you had a chance to see it here, but it's called. Uh, actually, I'm not going to mention it. I don't want people to watch it. Usually, yeah. when I watch a horror movie, you know, I get the shocks and scares at that moment. Yeah. And then that's fine. It doesn't. This movie really kind of, um, kind of influenced me in the most negative way that I have ever experienced from a movie like I've seen The Exorcist um, and uh, that was you know a little bit scary and then afterwards you but this one for days and days and days and maybe weeks after even now when I think about it it makes my soul feel darkness and really bad so I don't want anyone to watch it that's why I don't want to mention it it had a lot of those symbolisms yeah. you said so it had the triangle yeah very strong in the yeah. film right yeah. it had the eye you know the one eye very strong uh, in the yeah, film. Wow. yeah the all uh, finger yeah it had uh witchcraft it had uh black magic evil magic it even had cannibalism in it right yeah that's what they did so all of these things but it was done in such a way that it it, went, it reached into my soul and it made me just feel really uncomfortable i mean i watched it to the end because as a as a filmmaker and as a person who's academic, I, I wanted to see what yeah. happens and where it goes. But I really believe that you're right that there there are things that people produce media wise, things that they give out physically, right? That may have in it such evil that it impacts you and you don't even know why. And then you start having either depressive thoughts or uncomfortable thoughts or negative thoughts and you don't even know where these thoughts came from and how they got implanted in your mind and in your heart yeah it's so subtle and then yet you feel so unsettled by it you know you, you think like why am i why is this affecting me I, it didn't seem that bad but in reality it is it, especially for a believer you know you know like your 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 fitra is talking to you saying this is this is bad things. Stay away from them. You know what I mean? So, Alhamdulillah, I'm glad you had that reaction to it. It's just, you know, you have a very pure soul of <laughs> uh, But I think you're right. We need to educate our youth about this, right? Because especially now, with the access, I mean, when I was growing up, there was no internet, right? And then yeah. start internet coming in. By the time internet came in, I was kind of formed. I was in my 20s, so it was, you know, easier not to be uh, influenced by it so much but I think our youth now which have access to mobiles and tablets and computers and internet and uh, initially at one point it was um, pornography they were worried about but now I think also we need to educate them about things like this some symbolisms what the symbolisms mean how can they impact you when you see it how do you uh, decode the the messages and the signals that are embedded in these so it doesn't impact you how to stay away from it um, and if you see yeah. it in a in a website or a place, stay away. It's it's a it's an indication of be careful and be aware of what's going on in that website and in that forum and in that kind of environment. So these are important yeah. educations that I think uh, parents, especially first parents, and then the mosques and centers and organizations need to talk about. Um, I think what's happened a lot of become people have become the uh, sensitized to um, magic. The way we described it with with the pharaoh with the magicians with you know like the movies like harry potter it's become it's just, it's just a movie right it's just a story there's no reality mm -hmm. in it because the world is really governed by science science is something that you can see that you can experiment and you get the same result if you 
uh, do the experiment uh, some other time, right? So people yeah. have put this into the category of myth. So when you don't give it importance, when you don't give it credential, then it becomes there without you or your mind challenging it. Like you said, right? It becomes yeah. like a acceptable thing, but it's not really important. Don't worry about it because it's not real. But you have it yeah. all around you, like you said, movies, books, um, stories, <laughs> just building right here, in there, right? So, yeah. so, and I think like you're right. You don't you don't have to be necessarily Muslim to be impacted by it. I mean, because it's funny, isn't it? Like there's such a high rise of uh, mental illnesses, right? Depression and schizophrenia and all of these uh, issues. And no one looks at this stuff. Everyone's like, oh, it's just because of too much stress at work. Possibly. It's because yeah. of families breaking down. Possibly. But this also should be looked at um, from the way you've described it. I think it's very important. We as a community, at least, if, if not on a governmental level, we as a community have to look at that and, and, and see that it doesn't impact us. Um, you know, it's gotten to a point where, where mental illness has gotten taken so far that I, I feel like people just don't want to be accountable for anything. You know, like, how are we going to have a day of judgment if somebody has a mental illness that causes them to do everything bad in their life? Oh, I gossip because, you know, I have depression. Oh, you know, I, I, you know, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I have ADD, so I'm just going to be rude to you. You know, I can't control my thoughts. Like, people are just using excuses for everything nowadays, and they're okay with it. Well, no, you need to you know, hold yourself accountable, first of all. Not everything is defined by a mental illness. And we have to also take a look at the spiritual factors and make sure everything's okay with you. If you're, and, and by the way, the more you sin, right, the more susceptible you become to these things. I didn't mention it earlier, but when these magicians or sorcerers want to gain power, the thing they have to pay the jinn is by sinning. Okay? So there's a story of a magician who repented. And so the, the magician says, I wanted to gain access to the, to the powers of the jinn. And so what my teacher, so they have teachers, they have recruiters, what the recruiter told him is to go in a dark area, like a dark cave, draw a circle like the one you saw from that movie, sit in the circle for one week, and then he would use the bathroom in the same circle and he would also sleep in it. So his entire environment became nudges. It became impure. And once he reached that epitome of filth, the jinn came to him because the human body was in a state of impurity. You understand? Now, you don't really have to just rub yourself with impure things to get that. Your actions can also be impure. You understand? The rejection of faith is also impure. You know, doing these kind of behaviors, the zina and all this stuff, it makes you more and more impure inside as well. Now, when the jinn came to him, it gave him a little bit of his, you know, insights. And, you know, he dictated a couple of things to him. And so the, the person trying to get a hold of them, the person sitting in that circle says, now give me more. I want to learn how to do more. And the jinn says, no, 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 no. You need to do something for us if you want something. This was a sneak preview, as we say in the movie industry. And he says, well, what do I have to do? He says, you need to perform adultery. And he says, not any kind of adultery. You have to perform an act of adult, uh, adultery that's incest with a mahram. Then we will give you the rest of our knowledge. So this person would go on to do these things and then he would come to repent uh, and tell the story of how he became like this. But it's just crucial to understand that the further we get from, these, uh, from you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more susceptible we become to things that are unholy. And that's something to keep in mind. So that's the whole concept about the heart becoming darker, you know, with blemishes. That is exactly sin, it. it becomes that's darker exactly and darker. It. That's what it does. That's it exactly enables, it. it then attracts negativity and darkness, and which is, you know, concept of jinn. That's really scary. Uh, you, see, you see how this conversation is like helping you connect the dots of things you were taught and the reality of it. Mm. And that's why I think it's so crucial to discuss these things and not just brush them under the rug. Because now you see, well, when I sin, I become susceptible. Yeah. Before we didn't really see repercussions of sinning, other than oh, I'm going to answer for under your judgment. Yeah, yeah. So then this this disconnect with actual reality of how sin impacts you. So then if you do do it, you don't feel as bad because you don't see consequence immediately, right? 
Yeah. So that's that's a very important con- concept that I think youth and everyone really bear in mind. Myself, I talk about myself first. If I do something wrong, I should understand that there is repercussions that this energy wave of energy gives out to the universe, and then I'm attracting more negativity. Well, is there anything else you want to add before we stop scaring the audience? Because I think if I was watching this, I might have to make this a 18 plus. <laughs> well, there's a lot more radio art stuff, but we can leave it for another day. Uh, again, symbolism is out, out there. Um, and uh, it's very, it's just the last story I just want to share. Uh, it's from the Quran as well. Surah um, 37, Surah at Safa verse number 125 and so as you know prophet Suleiman was the prophet that would have the angels and the jinn not the angels sorry the jinn the animals everything would be at his command and he would go on to build that temple of solomon that's so highly revered and he built some sort of architecture that was beyond anybody's like comprehension and how he did it uh and so after the death of prophet Suleiman. Uh, the Quran mentions that the people went into a state of disarray and those jinns wanted vengeance for, uh, you know, because so Prophet Suleiman from the good jinns helped them build that temple. They wanted vengeance. And, and so people started going back to idol worship and all kinds of evil things. That they started sacrificing children and all kinds of strange things were happening after Prophet Suleiman's death. And this, this intermediary prophet that would come after uh, Prophet Suleiman would be Prophet Ilyas. And Allah mentions it in Surah Safar. I encourage everybody to read this surah um, just to understand how badly you can uh, mess up and not realize what you're doing. And, and so the, the people, when Prophet Ilyas came and saw them, they went from the government of Prophet Suleiman of prosperity and beauty and to the extent that the animals would trust the humans to complete and utter darkness. And they started worshiping something called a Ba'al. A Ba'al. Have you ever heard of that before? No, what's what's a baan? Okay, a baal, b a apostrophe l, l, yeah. So those are what today we call modern day obelisks. Okay, is that the okay, big thing now, that's in uh, Washington D.C.? The it, Washington it, Monument, and it's it around Egypt, the entire right? world. It's around the entire world, and any place you see that, it's an indication that we have succeeded. Okay, now pay attention to this. Uh, uh, what does what does uh, Prophet Elias say in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Are you worshiping that? Are you worshiping this, this you know, like pyramid like structure? And then he said, uh, what, and, and you have abandoned the best of creators to worship that. And, and you can see the utter disgust in Prophet Ilias's, um, in Prophet Ilyas's uh, temperament with them, he, he's disgusted that you could worship something like that. Now, people don't know what that is, right? Now, we can say it's a Masonic symbol, it's a, it's a devilish symbol. There is, there is a obsession with these jinn-worshipping people or Satanists or whatever you want to call them, and the, the human sexuality. There is an obsession with it, okay? And so what these, these structures are representing, it is the reproductive organ of a man the phallic symbol and people are worshiping it during the time of prophet Iliad. And, and there's a story as to where that comes from in ancient egypt if you know the story of osiris and set you know the story so osiris was the reigning god of egypt at the time and they, they, by the way if you trace these back they actually fall into a category of jinn so these are not gods but people depicted them as God because they had powers. So anyways, uh, th- that's why Tawheed comes and just kind of shuts all this stuff down. Tawheed is the most beautiful and puritanical sense of divinity. Okay? And you just, you know, just stay away from this nonsense. This is garbage. Let me Put say it away. Tawheed, for audience who are not uh, Arabic speaking, Tawheed is the unity of God as in the, the creator of, of the universe. Um, I don't want to say he or she because God is either he or she. But the word Allah, which is uh, not masculine or feminine, Allah, the Creator, He's uh, Allah should be the point of all worship, right? As opposed to anything yeah. else. Yeah, and, and so and so, uh, Osiris is that is that reigning king, and he marries his sister Isis. Pay attention to the names. The names are varying. Isis, I S I S. 
Uh, and so Osiris marries his sister and they have two children. Okay. And, and so his brother, Osiris's brother, Seth, becomes jealous. And so he kills him. And then he puts Osiris in this golden chest and sets it into the Nile for it to get lost. Isis, out of an act of love, goes and retrieves that chest, brings it back. But before she has a chance to resurrect him, Seth, the brother of Osiris again, cuts his body into 14 pieces. And so Isis, again, would go on to get her husband's body parts, except one out of the 14. And that would be his organ. And so, uh, so what had happened with his organ is that Seth had thrown it into the Nile and the beasts of the Nile had devoured it. And so Isis, seeing that that part of her husband was missing, would create the first obelisk. Yes? Obelisk, by definition, means shaft of Baal. <laughs> it literally means that. So he would create, she would create that and put it in place for him. Right? And, and the Masons and like the Satan worshippers have an obsession with that body part. And they want to show it. Now, Muslims hate that. Now, how do I know Muslims hate that? Do you remember prior to 2004, Reza, what Mena used to look like? Do you remember those little obelisks we used to pelt stones at in 2004? Oh, in, um, in Hajj, yes, yes. In Jamarat. In Jamarat. Jamarat. You, you recently went for it. Yes. Now, now, you recently went, if I'm not mistaken. You yeah. saw what they've done to it, right? It's they built a wall a around really it. It's a really wall, yeah, yeah. It's a stretch wall because they don't want people to get hurt. That's the excuse they gave. But why didn't you just... Because the original structures were obelisks. Yeah. Muslims used to pelt obelisks in a pilgrimage that they're wajib to do once in their lifetime. Which represented, right? which represented Satan. Abraham. Everything satanic. Everything satanic. The, it was a distastement towards this object that we see now in Washington and all around the world. There's literally hundreds of thousands of obelisks in the most beautiful cities that we call developed, okay? So they have, a, they have a fascination with architecture. And by the way, this goes back to the Tower of Babel. It's another story. Another I think, I think anyway, Napoleon stole uh, so, one from Egypt when he, when he conquered Egypt, an obelisk, took it back to France. Yep, 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 100%. There's, an, uh, there's a fascination with it and leadership too. So, uh, so we used to pelt these stones. And against these obelisks, up until 2004, Saudi Arabia, under some orders, went ahead and created these walls around it to protect the obelisk from getting hit from the stone, with the excuse that, you know, we should make the wall a little bit wider. My only question to that is, why didn't you shape it like the obelisk? So the symbol remains alive. You understand? The symbolism in the world of spirituality is so important. That's why when you look at the dollar bill, you see all the symbols. Right? So they kind of cover up the symbol. So the Muslim now is pelting a wall without realizing the symbol of Satan itself is standing back home right in front of That's him. absolutely crazy, huh? Yeah, it's all related. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what he was doing. He knew what to incorporate into the, uh, you know, the pilgrimage. And, and now, you know, you look at the Kaaba, rather, you look at the Kaaba, the most holy place in the Muslim world, right? Look at the surroundings of it. What has it turned into? Shopping you see that gigantic hotels. clock tower. Yeah. Yeah. What's the shape of the clock tower? It looks Let's like take a the, look at it. It looks like the horns. It looks like the um. What's that movie? Lord of the Rings. Have you have you seen Lord of the Rings? The eye Sauron. Of Sauron. Sauron yeah. Again, yeah. that's the eye, right? The single eye. That's the eye. Of Sauron. Right. The same eye. This eye of Sauron. It's the same satanic eye that's looking over at the eye of Ra. Goes back to ancient Egypt. It's the same one you see on the double. It's Symbolism is so, Islam is all about symbolism in the right way to get these things away from you, to condition the subconscious mind to not accept these things. But we see that even now, unfortunately, with that clock tower shadowing over the blessed house of God, you know, we, what, what can we expect from a world where people are so detached from the metaphysical? So it's almost uh, the way you're describing it is like these, um, these influences are subconsciously doing things and by people who are living in this world of subconscious uh, uh, messaging and encoding it enables yep. them to do other things which are more overt taking control with the financial system that you discussed earlier basically yep. running the world in a way where you know it's unjust but you become uh just you don't okay, have the that. desire to make change you're like oh well, what can i do it is what it is right yep. when's the last time you saw rebellion after 1979 when's the last time 
Well, hopefully, maybe this month. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but no, 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 not this rebellion. But the yeah. pure leadership of a man that just doesn't care about the world. You understand? Like someone that just really doesn't care. You know, we care too much. That's why we don't rebel. We, we want the dunya. And dunya in Arabic, comes the world, comes from Adina, you know? Like that thing is not the that great. State, yeah. The lowest state, yeah. The lowest state, you know, fil adnal Arab, the lowest state of the world. But you know, uh, so we we have attachment to this lowness. But people like that, who back then, I'd say fifty years ago, that was a generation of hope that people really uh, saw, um, you know, what rebellion can do, what going against the grain can do. Uh, you know, what can we do? You know, we we just we can only wake each other up and just make sure we don't fall back. Well, I hope people are woken up after this uh, podcast. I think I think <laughs> I it's been an amazing it. podcast. I'm, I think we, we've discussed um, some really important issues. Um, well, thank you for it's, having me. It's not been it's not been just scary, but I think it's been uh, education informative. And I think it, it, yeah. I personally am going to go away and look at things slightly differently as well now. And this is I'm me, a person who's doing a PhD in uh, identity and representation in Hollywood and everything like that. But I think I'm going to start looking at just my, my immediate surrounding within my own home yeah. and then project it further out and further out and further out. And even speak to people and say, look, you know, um, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, ask questions and try and find the source. Thank you so much. Even for the word you wrote, even the word you just said, Hollywood, right? Yeah. Hollywood. It's literally holy wood. Yeah. That's what they're referring to. Yeah. That's why they yeah. call it the magic the magic of yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. That's what they refer to. And they're referring to Prophet Musa's staff, of course, the holy wood that turns yeah. into a serpent. But the, that's the symbolism. It always goes back. There's certain phrases within our subconscious that we're not making sense of. And once you take that first step again to say, Allah, you show me, those doors will constantly open and it'll help, help you become less susceptible. But again, thank you so much for having me on this show. It's been a pleasure. Ben. We look forward to doing part two. Is there anything? Um, <laughs> is there anything that you're working on now that you want us to know about? Any projects or any anything that you like to um, give a shout out to? Uh, no projects. Uh, you know, I, I'm a bit of a hermit myself, so. Uh, Have you considered writing for... stuff? You know, participating in writing and sharing like that. You know, I never did until you just mentioned it. Uh, I think I think it's time because I, I've kind of been disappointed by the lack of resources today. I had to scavenge a lot and for I'm saying maybe months until I could really make sense of what's happening uh, and try to help people. Uh, I really want to help people. And uh, I, I, you know, it's not, uh, this is not like a marketing. I don't want anybody's money or anything like that, but I, I have seen close ones become affected by this and I've seen them emerge out of it. And ever since then, uh, I have seen the same result happen over and over again. So, so uh, when I go and talk to certain spiritual leaders, they they kind of dismiss me, and they look at me like he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he's crazy, and that's because their teachers talk to them like that about these things too. So, if we can just have a little bit of an awakening, and maybe if I do get my hands on some sort of PDF ebook that I can write for everybody, um, it doesn't have to be a book. It could be like articles, you know, of your experiences well, that yeah. you can share. Um, I think I think it's 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 needed because we don't really ha have access to it, you know. Uh, other than yeah. this podcast, yeah. I mean, you you get the occasional person, and you see a lecture, someone yeah. talking about gin, uh, a little bit, and then that's it. Putting it together in yeah. the context of how I live my life and how it does can, yeah, can impact yeah, me in a holistic way, it's not being done. So I'm ho I hope you do take that up and write some articles and we try and get some connections of people that will publish them for you. You'll be the first to know. Thank you so much. Okay, My then. pleasure. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Thank you for having us. All right. As salam. I'm glad you watched our video. Please follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter to be notified of future video releases.